Big Ten want to do? Because that's the question. Max Olson, TheAthletic.com, joins us on Thursdays. We appreciate his time and access whenever we get it on 365 Sports. Max, thanks for your time. Your thoughts about uh, this deal with the NCAA, there was a thought that eventually they might just evaporate, right? And the FBS would move on. And it appears now that may not or will not, will not happen. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I was a big believer that that was, uh, you know, actually going to play out here. I think it's when you actually get into the logistics of how you pull that off, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you start to put an organization together that enforces rules and creates rules and all that stuff. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know that the full, the full breakaway there is, is necessarily going to be the outcome, but, you know, certainly at the FBS level, um, I think we can all agree football probably needs to be governed in a different way. And so, yeah, still a lot on the AD side to work through there. Of what is the future of this? And, and, and truly, not not just doing you know transformative changes in study rules, but but truly embracing like what does this really need to look like five ten years from now? Do you think that they have the gumption to stick this through and not stop halfway? <laughs> based on based on what precedent? Yeah, that's that's why I asked. <laughs> I don't know. I I, I think that. Um, you know, there, there's just so many moving parts to that, whether you're talking about pay for play or, or just all the issues on the plate of AD right now. I remember talking with Bob Bowles at Mitchell Media Days, and he told me, uh, that, you know, as he's getting ready to retire, he was like, the last thing I would want to be right now is an AD in college athletics because there's just so many, there's just so many problems you got to deal with now. It's way different than when he was running, you know, Iowa or Stanford back in the day. I, I think that, that that big picture conversation, yeah, and then actually getting to the finish line on things. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a long process. So Max, uh, the time finally came for Scott Frost in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, Nebraska makes the move. They're moving on Mickey Joseph, the interim. Um, you had a big piece on the athletic about Frost and, and the program and, uh, just all that's gone on, uh, your thoughts, uh, it, the fact that it's happening now, what that means for Nebraska and just kind of the general feeling overall in Lincoln. Yeah, I mean, on, on Saturday night when I watched Georgia Southern uh, beat Nebraska and put up the most yards ever allowed in Memorial Stadium, uh, I, I didn't actually think Scott Frost was going to get fired on Sunday. I thought probably that game would seal his fate, but you know, clearly Trav Alberts uh, has the support now to uh, to make that move, and uh, you know, I think it's probably gives the Nebraska a chance to be a little bit more competitive the rest of the season because they don't have that cloud hanging over them now. These guys, uh, you know still love the coaches on their staff and will play hard for them. And, you know, it's not all about Scott Frost and his, his job being on the line and his decision-making every week. So interested to see how they respond this week against Oklahoma, obviously a big underdog, um, you know, and I, you know, can Mickey Joseph kind of, uh, kind of settle things down there a little bit. I think they'll probably respond well and, and, and put up a pretty good fight in that game. But yeah, certainly it was time. I just thought, and, you know, when you look at the decision last year to give him another year, just didn't I didn't really see any way that that would that would lead to an outcome that was the that, that was going to work out for Nebraska. I, I thought it was inevitable that this was going to fail, and to knock it out after three games was a surprise. But Nebraska has also been, uh, you know, a, especially on defense, uh, worse than people expected. You sent me. You and I traded a couple of text messages. I said, "What is a great article on Frost? A lot of insight." And you said, uh, I, I asked you about uh, the, the truth bullets that you put out there. Some of it was the, the transition, the attrition, all of that. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share what you said to me. You know who doesn't have that problem? Dave Aranda. Because guys trust him and believe in what he's saying and doing. Is that what happened in a lot of ways with Scott Frost? Did people just stop trusting him? Max, you there? Oh, okay. Sorry, guys. Sorry about sorry. that. That's okay. You got me. Yeah. No, I, I think, you know, I, I think that's right. And, and, you know, I think the, the reason we talked about that is, you know, I wrote a piece yesterday looking at just the, the, the roster issues Nebraska had. Um, they lost 56 transfers during the Frost era. That was the second most in the Big Ten. And that includes a ton of the guys that he recruited and brought to Lincoln. 40 of the players in his first three classes, um, you know, decided to move on from the program. And whether that's because they weren't good enough to play in the Big Ten or they weren't happy or they weren't getting playing time or they weren't, you know, wh whatever the reason, um, you, you can't build a good developmental program, um, you know, when, you, when you're losing that many guys. And I think, you know, you look at this last offseason and Baylor, you know, really didn't lose that many transfers. I just bring that up to, as a contrast to say I think there is a big culture piece to that. It's not just about recruiting and it's not just about, 
oh, the, you know, the crazy times these days we're living in, and it's so easy for guys to move on. I think, you know, when you look at a lot of programs, especially in this part of the country around Nebraska that are succeeding, they don't lose a ton of transfers. And that's because I think you, you generally know what you're looking for in recruiting, and guys believe in the blueprint and want to stay and want to get better and want to develop, you know, these veteran teams that can compete for conference championships. Nebraska just really has kind of been failing to do that. And that's why I think you see a lot of these, you know, whether it's Matt Campbell, Chris Kleiman, Lance Leifold, those kind of guys, you, you kind of see them getting uh, thrown around for these jobs because it takes that kind of coach, I think, to be successful at Nebraska. And there's just really no shortcuts with that. And, and I think Aranda is a great example of, you know, guys stay at Baylor because they believe in the mission. They believe that the coach has their best interest at heart. And is, is, is uh, you know, I, I think that uh, w- when the, coach isn't, you know, isn't as genuine and doesn't have that good of a culture, you're going to have a lot of attrition and a lot of problems. Do you think, if you mentioned some of the guys that, you know, on the, the rumor mill, do you think that they, that Trev Alberts will try to swing big, much like the coaching cycle last year, or is that not necessarily the case? Can he do this by grabbing an up and comer? Yeah. I mean, I, the, the, it's a very different search now than I, than I expected because, you usually expect this to be something you're dealing with in late November and you got a pretty short window there and you got to kind of narrow it down to a couple guys. And, you know, now it's all out in the open there. Nebraska's open and Trev Alberts has, what, 10 weeks or so to, to kind of sit back and see um, who impresses him and to do his homework on, you know, I think it's going to be a lot, a lot larger cast of potential candidates here. And there'll probably be a ton of rumors and speculation and all that stuff. A lot of people tied to it. But I think Trev Alberts gets to, to take a closer look at you know, maybe there's some of those guys out there like a, like a Jamie Chadwell where you're just sort of like, yeah, maybe he wouldn't have been considered very seriously for it. But now you get maybe those guys, those, those sort of G5 guys, maybe have a little bit more of a chance. Or or maybe a Lance Leipold has a little bit more of a chance where you can go really look at what they're doing and, and say, yeah, the record at Kansas is not great. And, and it's very hard to be successful there. But maybe you get taken a little more seriously in, through a search like this. And, yeah, I mean, in terms of big swings, I, I don't expect them to go after Urban Meyer. Um, but I do think that probably that there's probably a few names out there that I'd imagine they're going to look into. Um, I would be curious what the situation is going to be, you know, in Carolina. And is, is Matt Rule a guy that could be up for this job, depending on how things work out there? But I, I, I'm not saying he's a guy, but I mean, I, I, I could see that making sense if he were let go in, in Carolina. I, I, I think there's going to be when we when we get down to it here in November, man, there's going to probably be a bunch of names out there and, and a bunch of rumors for sure. Yeah, Max, you just you just said his name. I was thinking of, of Matt Rule while you were talking as well. Is definitely a guy we're going to be hearing a lot about during I think this this coaching cycle with just. Well, his... I mean, Smokey, don't don't you think the culture piece is there? Yeah, if you, if you make that move. Yeah, no, I, I I do. I don't know if that means he's going to be you know in two years you're going to start hearing about him going somewhere else. Uh, I'm not sure if that NFL aspirations now is as hot a right. uh, topic. Although it's hard to win the NFL. Yeah, no, I thought about that. I really have because it seems like it fits, and I think his what his his game and the way he talks would fit there. Uh, you know, he's got the old Penn State model, right? Well, Nebraska yeah. and Penn State were almost identical in many many different ways. Yeah, that's right. I, I could see him being. You know, now obviously the timing on that is tricky. I think that the Panthers uh, week thirteen bye is uh, around the same time Nebraska's regular season ends, I, I, and I'm not wishing for him to fail and, and lose his job by any means, but. You know, I, I am curious, as, you know, as much as it might seem like a, the obvious choice here is, is probably Matt Campbell, and that's probably how I see it today. Uh, at the same time, it's probably going to be a pretty uh, pretty interesting uh, road that they're going down here, uh, where there's probably going to be, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that this is as hard of a job as, as Scott Frost made it look, and I think the compensation, you know, when, when the guy's already making $5 million, is going to be attractive to people. I think the, the new Big Ten deal is going to be attractive to people. It'll be interesting to see which kind of coaches are drawn to the job. So, Max, what do you think it's like to be Jimbo Fisher right now after starting a um, a slap fight with Nick Saban in the summer and now losing to App State? Yeah, it's uh, it's not going the way they planned uh, this year. I, I don't, and it's hard. It's hard to like. Obviously, offensively, it's not working. But is it? You know, is a switch to Mac John- Max Johnson like all they need this week? I'm, I'm, I think it's probably a little bit more complicated than that. And cer- certainly, like, I don't know that there's somebody on that staff that, that you know, giving them the play calling would really kind of fix things. I think it's, it's something that Jimbo Fisher is going to have to kind of, you know, climb out of this hole here a little bit and figure out how do we, you know, take advantage of the pieces we've got. Because, you know, I think the thing we probably underrated a little bit these past few years was 
Trayvon Williams was really good, and Isaiah Spiller was really good. I think those guys gave you something pretty reliable on early downs that you could, you know, no matter where your quarterback play was at, you knew those guys were going to get you, you know, good yards and explosive plays. And so A-Chain's a really talented player, and I'm not trying to take anything away from him, but, um, you know, I think that run game isn't quite looking like how it should. And, uh, you know, certainly the passing game under Haynes King is, is uh, that, was, that was a rough week last week. And so uh, with Miami coming to town, man, real challenge. And that schedule just, it won't get any easier. So they've got to figure out, uh, I'm sure Jimbo's going to have a great plan for this week and, and really try to prove people wrong. But, uh, man, there's some real there's some real issues there that they've got to kind of find a way to, to cover up here. As if things couldn't be worse for AM, Max, you have their hated rival who's going to be joining them soon in the, the conference that they were able to brag about the last few years, and, and that hated rival is going toe-to-toe with the number one team in the country. We've all had fun with the Texas's back memes and the Kansas losses yeah. and all of that, um, but that felt different on Saturday. Do you agree? I do, and guys, if if, Hank, or if, uh, if Quinn Ewers hadn't got hurt, I think we'd probably be talking about Texas very differently this week. Yeah. You know, I think that, um, you know, and, and it'll be interesting to see how quickly, how long he's out. Can you actually get him back for Red River or, or how much of a setback this is going to be? But, man, that, that quarter that he played against Alabama, you, you really saw what, what everyone, you know, that, that's the Quinn Ewers that, that he has that potential to, to be pretty special just in terms of the playmaking ability downfield and the throws that he can make. So, um, yeah, it was. It, I've covered a lot of Texas football games, and that was one of the best I've seen from them in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of having a really good plan, in terms of p- playing with great effort, which is is always the, kind of the problem in Texas. And then I thought the crowd at DKR was as good as I've seen. So I, it was pretty impressive, just in terms of a showing of here's what Texas can be when they put it all together. Now, will they play with that kind of effort this week and against UTSA and every week going forward? Like that's the real challenge that you got to kind of change the culture there a little bit, but uh, man, it was, it was pretty impressive. And I was certainly, certainly expecting a blowout in that one. And then you change one play in that. And, and suddenly Texas is, you know, Texas wins and they're I don't know, top 15, top 10, something like that. And we're talking about them as, as the big 12 title favorite. Max, uh, elsewhere last weekend, uh, I don't know how many people saw it, uh, although I guess the TV number was pretty healthy, but late at night in Provo, Utah on Saturday, BYU and Baylor in overtime, uh, Kalani Sataki and company get a massive win. It was a dogfight. Uh, what were your thoughts just on kind of you know where BYU is now and, and the chatter kind of with their schedule? You have to start paying attention to them a little bit, especially if they win in Oregon this weekend, but, but also your thoughts on Dave Aranda and company, a bruising loss, and, and trying to rebound from that. Yeah, I mean, you, you guys think that uh, Big 12 teams are going to have fun making that trip here starting next year? That's uh, going to be the one that when the schedule comes out, yeah. you're going to look at, okay, are we playing at BYU? Yep. When is it? You know, who's afterwards? Who's before? All that kind of jazz. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be one you circle. Yeah, it, there are going to be a few coaches groaning for sure when they say they've <laughs> got to make that late night trip to, to BYU next year. I, I think it's – and that's just such a – what a great home field advantage for them, and, and they build such tough teams there. I thought that was an impressive one. Uh, by BYU to get revenge for that game. And, and I think that, um, you know, I, I think that's a program. It's going to be really interesting to see kind of how they match up the Big 12 teams on, on a weekly basis next year because I'm not sure, like, uh, would you say that's not a Power 5 roster? Like, I, I don't think they're that far off from being a Power 5 roster probably. And they're a little bit, you know, they're extremely unique in terms of how they build that with the guys that, you know, go on missions and come back and are a lot more mature and, and physically developed and stuff. But, Man, what a, it, it's a big one for, for BYU for sure. And, and that was a team that I kind of circled, you know, like when we're doing the FWA, uh, you know, top 16. I, I had them in my top 16, I think at 13, a couple weeks ago, because I just felt like you looked at the pieces they had coming back and really liked that team. And, and yeah, they've got some big time games with Oregon up next on the schedule where, where you find out about, you know, they've got some real challenges this year in this last year of independence play. But, but yeah, it, it was. I, I thought a really you know gritty win by BYU, and I, I think Baylor's going to be okay. But that's just a that's just a, a total trap game to, to go into there in non conference play. One of the things about joining the conference is you can beat a team, or you might have some wins. The question is week in and week out, and th- and that and Brigham Young I think is strong enough and good enough to do that. And he'll find that's where you go from Baylor, then you play Oregon, then you get and, Notre Dame yeah, a little bit later, and, then, and you get Arkansas. Right. So, yeah, yeah, and and that will be fun. And I know that's what Kalani Sataki is talking about and and and, and working on. In but fact, man, don't you guys think they could beat Notre Dame the way things oh, are working oh, yeah. out Absolutely. for Notre Dame? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there was the story yesterday. The NCAA instructed football programs to remove the names of any student athletes who entered the transfer portal. Since the new transfer portal windows went into effect August the 31st, 
This kind of yeah. confuses me. What actually does this mean? Yeah, that, that was just a one-time fix. Uh, basically, when they when they set the new rules for the portal, those rules went into effect immediately, which means that what, what it's supposed to mean is that no players are entering the portal until December 5th. Well, there were some players that were still going in because they were leaving their team and they're going in. And, and so this was just the of like giving them instruction this week of, hey, take them out, put them back in on, in December because that's when – you know, that's when they, you know, you need to go in the window in order to be immediately eligible to make that change. So I, I think that what that means is that we shouldn't see players entering the portal till December. Now, you'll probably see some players announce, hey, I'm, I'm leaving the team. I'm going to go in the portal later. And But, you know, to what extent we're curbing that, we'll be interested to see. But, um, you know, I, I think right now it, it's going to mean that hopefully that door is closed right now and these players need to, you know, stay with you. Yeah, you, you're going to have some decisions to make at that four-game redshirt and stuff, but uh, it, it should mean we shouldn't have too many players uh, trying to hit the portal between now and uh, the end of November. This is the line that I read. The schools were also told not to contact any student-athletes who entered the portal. That's not going to – yeah, right, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was just one of those deals. Where, so, like there was a player from, I think, Colorado State who went in and then went through right away because it was just – that information wasn't totally out there to everybody yet that, yeah, the door is closed right now. In terms of entering the portal, there's no benefit in doing that right now. You need to go in during the window. So, you know, we'll see, guys. I mean, hopefully that means that there are some players that even if they're unhappy in their situation right now, just give it the rest of the season and see what happens before you make that move. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, – there's nothing wrong with that. Having a little bit of time and patience to, to make a pretty big decision. Max, let's close it with this. We started with Nebraska – now it's Nebraska, Oklahoma. What are your thoughts on this game? I don't feel like we've really learned a ton about Brent Venables and the Sooners just yet because of who they played. Nebraska is obviously going to be at home. You got the interim with Mickey Joseph. What are your expectations this weekend? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know how much it really got that much attention with other games on last weekend, but you know, Oklahoma had had some issues early on with Kent State. It was a seven-three game at halftime. Kent State got stopped on the first four drives against Oklahoma. Um, I, I think that's probably to some extent, you know, Kent State's not a bad program by any means, um, but I think that's probably just a sign of, you know, Oklahoma still, it, it's not all totally clicking yet. I think the defense has looked pretty good. Uh, and offensively, you know, they've got the firepower. They've, they've got the ability to score a lot of points. And once they got rolling, they were just fine. But, um, you know, I, I, I think Oklahoma is going to be a better team in, in, you know, a month from now than they are today. And that's just part of being in year one. So this is a big test for them. They've got K-State right after this to open conference play. I think we all agree K-State's looking pretty good. Um, so we're going to find out a lot about Oklahoma. You know, if they can take care of business in this one, you're, you're feeling pretty good about, you know, their, their chances to be one of the best in the Big 12. But, you know, they're a top-10 team right now. Have, have they played like one yet? I don't know that they've really been challenged like one yet so far. So, um, you know, if Nebraska can, can actually play some defense this week, mm. uh, it could be a pretty fun game. Yeah, it'd be nice. <laughs> That would be nice. They played them well last year, uh, yeah. but that was a really good Much defensive Much closer than team. I expected last year. Yeah, yeah me too. Sure. Max, as always, thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Max Olson, theathletic.com, at Max underscore Olson, O-L-S-O-N, on Twitter. Yeah, that's, that's going to be interesting just to see kind of how Nebraska